This is the Living 1982 podcast. Were you into the punk scene in the very early 80s or someone who discovered the genre along the way? Well, we're doing some deep diving into the Seattle punk scene and sharing the story behind a band that was very short-lived but made a lasting impact with members going on to being in some of the biggest bands in the world. Their debut album was never released back in the day but is finally out now. This is the story of The Living. On today's episode of The Living 1982 podcast, we are joined by Andy Fortier, a.k.a. Andy Freeze of The Veins, The Thankless Dogs, and uh, you know, Dads. Other, other esteemed bands. Um, and uh, so... <clears throat> I never saw the Thankless Dogs. Did you guys? Did you guys play shows? No, we never played a show with the Thankless Dogs. It was uh, so Duff and I met Chris Udding, and um, and where did you meet Chris? I, you know, he just fucking showed up out of nowhere. I have no yeah. idea. It was at Duff's mom's house, and he was like, "Well, I heard you guys do, you know, and Chris would, you know, he was older, and you know, by." two or three years, whatever it was. And so somehow we got hook, hooked up with him and then ref, Mike Refuser had a, had a uh, he was renting down off airport way, right off the exit there. He had a, you know, apartment down there above some sort of chemical plant or something. I don't know what it was. And like I say, I was probably 15, Teen, very early on, Duff was probably 14. And we went down there and we just started playing with Mike and we rehearsed for, you know, two, three months. We weren't any fucking good. You know, I just started playing drums maybe a year before that. And, but um, then we, we got kind of good and then the refusers got back together. So we never did a gig. So, and then that's what turned into the veins. Right, right. It was the you three guys playing with with Mike Refuser. Mike Refuser, for the record, uh, was you know an old uh, an old punk rocker. Uh, you know, from the sort of from the 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 like a pre punk punk rock. Yeah, he was he was a you know a, a you know. Ramonesy kind of New York dog, you know, you know, 75, 76. Right, right, right. And and you know, maybe closest, you know, sort of a Lemmy character, you know, maybe not quite the the voice of a Joey Ramone or something like that. A little, yeah. you know, like like a, a you know, a street level, like a punk rocker before there was punk rock. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I remember I saw him like a, two years ago or whatever during the uh, hell. What, I think it was the Enemy reunion or show or something. Right, right, the bird, the bird forty year and yeah, yeah, yeah. I was down there and he didn't fucking recognize me because he was you know half in the bag, and and I was like looking at him, I, I go Mike and I'm sitting here talking to him and and he was a he was a good songwriter. He had some good hooks and stuff. I remember he had this one song which was. If you see my K E D, please won't you tell her I'm sorry? Basically fucked, you know. And I and I said that to him and he looked at me and goes, What the fuck? Who are you? I go, Mike, it's Andy Fortier. It's Andy Fritt. And he's like, Oh my God, you know, and then a month later he died or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, he did have some good songs and, and the refusers, you know, definitely had some good some good periods throughout their uh throughout their history they were one of the you know first first seattle punk bands that that we saw back in the the bird days which was you know maybe just a couple years before that when we were first getting our first bands together the refusers were already going i believe right kind of and, a, kind of more like a, you know almost like in like a uh what the elton hope band what the hell was the name of the band elton hope was in uh Mentors, mentors, you know, kind of yeah. like a two steps down from the mentors and some right, right, right. Another three piece, you know, band of of people that have been playing, you know, dirty hard rock tunes before, before, uh, you know, nineteen seventy seven punk rock came came to be, um, 
and uh, you know the the refuses were you know not quite as outlandish as the uh, as the mentors, but no, 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 much, no. You know, a parallel existence, you know, and and so they're playing hard, sludgy, you know, punky music. Yeah, and then next thing you know, there's this thing called punk rock. So so they had a, uh, you know, the door was kicked open for you know the bands like that to uh, to uh, to go through. Well, yeah. the, the good thing about the good thing about disco is that's what turned us all into fucking punk rockers. Because right, right, because of course you had to hate disco back you then. You no, had to no hate disco. Question about that? It's like yeah. And biggest, and, disappoint, uh, biggest disappointment in my life is when Blondie went and did disco. I was just like, oh fuck. Oh my God! You know, oh my like, how God, dare they go? Stoop, 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 stoop. You know, how dare they use that? Uh, yeah. uh, and then, you know, in hindsight, it's like, um, I didn't really hate this guy. Oh, no, no, it wasn't that bad. No, I, wasn't I, I got, I got caught listening to Heart of Glass. You know, that's like, oh. <laughs> or you know what? The one that I figured out not that long ago, Fog Hat Slow Ride. Oh, yeah. You know, and they were, you know, what they were right in whatever years that was, 75, 76. It's like disco sucks, you know, burn your disco records. And if you listen to Slow Ride by Fog Hat, it's a disco song. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, you hard rockers. It it's expertly played, it's fantastic, and it's a great hard rock tune too. But I mean it it's 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 you know 90% <laughs> disco. <laughs> and yeah. you know. The, the, they had the audacity to pull it off and, and nobody, none of the uh, disco sucks people were the wiser because it was still, uh, yeah. Still well, mainstream, ra mainstream radio then in, 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 you know, by 79 mainstream radio, I just couldn't fucking listen to it anymore. It was no, just, even earlier than that, probably by 78. I mean, there were still some cool hard rock bands and stuff, but they weren't on mainstream radio. Well, you know, in 79, I was able to drive. Well, not that I didn't drive before that, but it was usually in a stolen car. But um, you, didn't, you didn't let uh, not having a license or not having a car keep you from driving places. No, 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 no. I didn't do that. But I, but, but I didn't listen to the radio that much then, though, oh, yeah. too. Because no, you said I just played all my Led Zeppelin and Bad Company and, you know, fucking David Bowie and, yeah. you know. On, on cassettes. Yeah, or even vinyl. We'd go over to Duff's house and we'd listen oh, to I, was just thinking, I remember we heard Motorhead. The first time we heard Motorhead, you know, uh what was that? Uh Ace of Spades came out and then uh yeah, it was you know, and then Duff got that the album um uh Motley that Motley Crue album, Merry Go Around Around, you know, whatever. Oh yeah, album. first Motley Crue record was yeah, was I was old. just like wow. And Frank Verona, aka Nick uh I think Nikki Six. He's from Seattle. Where right, he went to Roosevelt, huh? Yeah. 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 He's somebody I, I've never met. I don't don't know him, but of course. I never met him. I, I think I met him when I was a kid because he hung out with some, but I knew, but I was like, you know, 10, 11 years old and he was. Right, right, right. It was before you picked up the stick. Yeah. Yeah. He was. <clears throat> but anyway, you're practicing with. Mike Refuser getting this new band together, the Thankless Dogs, and this would have been this would have been 1979. It might have been 78. It could have well, it could have been late but, 78 because we recorded the main single in 79, I believe. Well, the but I, I but I'm I'm horrible with dates, you know. Yeah, I, well, you I've, know. I've got a, I've got a few dates here I can throw at you to uh, okay. To maybe refresh your um, refresh your memory, the first the first Veins show was March 1980. 1980, okay. And that was that was the the famed uh, Veins, which at, you and I both played at. Yeah, yeah, it was the first Fastbacks show, the first Veins show. And you were playing drums, were you? I was playing drums in the Fastbacks. Yeah, that. so it would be seventy, late seventy nine, then that, that the Thankless Dogs got together. Then. Right, right, and and you know, not even knowing the Thankless Dogs, I only know, I mean, because I knew Mike Refuser back then, but I, you know, I can't remember when I met you guys. You know, it could have been. I don't remember going to that party <laughs> out by my parents' house. Maybe I was there, maybe I wasn't. No, I don't think you were there. You weren't okay. there at the Riviera party. I think Kim was there. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it was all, you know, yeah. it was all where we where we grew up. <laughs> and, you know, but I mean, I, I would have I would have met you guys like instantly after that for sure. The funny thing is, is I bought a house right on Sandpoint Way in 107th. I've sold it since. Oh yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, just up the street. All the time I go by there, I go, oh, there's her. Kurt and Al and Dittman lived right down 103rd right there. <laughs> yeah, no doubt that was that was quite the uh, quite the corner of uh, of rock and roll. There you go for yeah. its, for its day. Um, and uh, the, the the reason I know, and this is just by sheer coincidence that I have the, uh, ah, the main. I don't even have. I don't even have one of those. Well, there's the. Uh, there's there the back. Uh, you can see the young uh, Duff and Andy and and uh, Charlie Chris Ryan Brown. and uh, David Scott's on there. David Scott, who would play drums for Psycho Pop at that first uh, Laurel Hurst Rex Center show. Right. Um, amongst who was in Psycho Pop? I can't even remember. Was was uh, um, was, was Tom Price in Psycho Pop? Uh, Tom Price was the bass player in Psycho Pop. So oh. you guys are playing with Mike Refuser. You're kind of thrown in this, you know, you and, and, and Chris Setting, Duff, all thrown in this kind of stew. And yeah. uh, 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 Refuser ends up getting back with his old, with his old bands and band. And you guys, you, oh, we've been playing now for a few months. We should start a band, I imagine. Well, that, it basically just morphed out of that. Chris Hutting was the one who, you know, he was really pissed at Refuser because, you know, he thought this was his rocket to start him. <laughs> and, then, and, you know, in, in hindsight, it probably was the, the very best thing he could do is not be in that band because then um, he, you, you guys start playing the three of you. He goes to the fabled American Music, buys a PA system, because he got he got a set he was in I don't know if he got it I can't remember the exact exactly what happened I, I don't he got some sort of settlement I don't know if it was from some injury or if it was an inheritance but he got like seventeen thousand bucks and uh, American Music had this deal if you buy a PA if you spend X you get ten hours on our and it was we were the first band to record in that studio is this yeah, yeah. So we got ten hours, and we chumped that out in ten hours. Or probably yeah, yeah. Less. as as yeah. as one would back then. Okay, oh, yeah. so he, buy, he buys the sound system, gets the uh, uh, recording package as a bonus. You go to the studio, and you you get a you record a day of recording and a thousand forty five. So at that time, you and and Duff and Chris were his band at the time. So. You recorded, you made the Vane single, and uh, the song um, "The Loser" mm -hmm. is clearly, uh, clearly about Mike Refuser. Mike Refuser. Um, uh, uh, what was the uh, Refuser? You fucking user. You you probably knew it all the time. When when he asked for a second chance, he let us hanging on the line. Now that it's over, we're glad we got away from you. We didn't get pulled down with you and let a loser like you take over, because uh, because Mike Refuser wanted to get back into the into the veins and redo it because his you know his fucking drug addict people in the in the Refusers and we just were like fuck you no way. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, that so that all that all that all that all adds up. I was like, I'm sure that refers to something, but I'm not sure what. So, that was it. So you guys start playing. And maybe he, he could have very well have been at that Laurel Hurst Rec show. Uh, no, I think he was just still because that Laurel Hurst Rec show was pretty, pretty uh, new into it. I think he was still trying to do the refuser. I, I mean, maybe he was okay. there or not. I don't know. But sometime between that, you know, because he, he like he'd be go, well, these guys are actually pretty cool. They're they got something going. I want to get back with those guys because my other band is not not getting anywhere. Maybe a little too much heroin, I think, in the old band. So yeah, you, know, you know, that's pretty common, you know, just a, a pretty common thing for ruining uh bands in general. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um and uh, but sometime before you guys recorded this single, he came back and said Oh, and, and you guys are like, you know, fuck you, you loser. We're not yeah. gonna take this shit. 
we're polished and we know shit. Yeah. We know it, I think is what it was actually. Oh no, we know shit. Oh, is that what it says? It, it, it's very, very pronounced. It's like, well, that's, that's bold. You yeah. Know, we're polished. You guys, you know, you guys had it all. Sure. Uh, and so how many shows did the veins do? I have no clue. Probably maybe 10. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, that was back when we would do shows. I mean, you, you, you know, back in those days, the, the promoter was you. The, the venue person that rented it was you. You know, you had to put this shit on. Right, you know, right, right. You get, you get somebody that you kind of trusted to collect the fucking $2 at the, at the door and hopefully no you gave you at least half. You know, so uh, yeah, for sure. You you know, get Chris Utting's PA system. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and, and he's gonna collect a little money for, um, you know, bringing that down because you know he bought it for sure. I mean, it, you know, must have cost some money for you to get a day of recording time and a thousand forty fives as a bonus for buying something. You know, it must yeah. have cost some money. Um, but but it's funny for, because like like when, because I remember you know the song the fake that's on there. Oh, sure, sure. Okay, you slow that down, and that's the riff to "Welcome to the Jungle." Now, not but that Duff wrote that song, so it's all his his thing. Yeah, yeah. But I think that we, I think that we rehearsed, or Duff came up with that song maybe two or three weeks before we went into the studio. He came up with that riff, and then we went through that. So, so not all that you know stuff was written, you know, because we were probably together for I'm gonna you know, and I lose track of time. Oh, for sure. Probably five months of, you know, doing shows and, mm -hmm. you know, getting polished and we know shit. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. That's when, that's when it was clear that you weren't going to take any shit because you were yeah. polished. And you, you know, were polished. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you do the, the show, it's uh, 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 early 1980, February or March is your, your first show. And throughout, the you know 1980 you know like whatever i'm not sure because I, I i know that you guys did some other shows but i'm not really aware of you know what what other shows you guys did but of course you know just playing probably the gorilla room you right. know we got busted in the gorilla room yeah yeah we were you know because i i was what 17 years old or whatever and um or whatever it was 19 yeah 17 and so um we we played the fucking gorilla room and i'm sitting there playing asteroids with a beer drinking a beer and all of a sudden the the liquor control board comes in he goes well can i see your id and i go id what do you mean but and, I come, and he goes to show us his badge and I go, oh no, I got a minor musician for me. He goes, he goes, come on, come outside. You know, <laughs> Duff got busted, I got busted, and they took me down to the to the where they stored all the liquor down there off of, you know, south of the kingdom down yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they went in there and they're like showing being real nice, showing me around. And I'm like, look, how the fuck do we get in here after hours? <laughs> it's full of fucking booze, you know. Um, Why did they they took you from the gorilla room down there? No, I had to I had to show oh. up the day later. Right, right, because that, 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 that was where you went. That was where you went to get your minor musician permits, right? Oh well, I don't don't know that I've never had one. So yeah, yeah, but uh, that's where you know that's where you would go. Like after a while, I mean, the, like by by the time everything started happening, I mean, you didn't need a minor musician permit to play at the gorilla room because nobody checked anyone's ID. Anyway, you know, to play there or go there, so that was easy enough. Um, uh, and then I guess it wasn't until later in 1981 that even I turned 21. I'm not sure what we did. <laughs> I, don't, I, really... I don't remember filling out minor musician permits that much. I think the places like Rex and and stuff like that. I guess you just it just didn't matter. And you know we do shows at the UCT Hall or the yeah, IOF Hall. Yeah. Or the, yeah. the IOF. That's where Cleavage, Cleavage did IOF. That was that. I think that was our last last. I think that was the last band I was in with Duff was Cleavage. And okay, so was, so the veins um, at some point 
that sort of just what happened to, what happened to the veins why did the veins uh, what stop? happened to the veins chris Hedding. okay you, you know were just done with him okay you you were done with him this would have probably been later in 1980 yeah pro probably not too long after we did the album or the mm -hmm. ep and and so you joined cleavage which no, was the zip dads i think was zip dads, okay, the zip dads which was that's when you know that's when that's when cop potty Dittman came into the picture right right so so the the zip dads were you on drums scott Dittman, singer slats on guitar who was the bass player duff, duff okay so it's still you and duff oh you me, duff and i were up until uh i let uh, up thankless dogs the veins the zip dads cleavage and then I went to the Deans, and that's when Duff started the, I believe it was the living. Well, or he started fucking around, you know, playing with you guys and doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, because it looks like he joined the Fastbacks somewhere late in 1980. Our first show was in December 1980 with Duff on drums. Right. And, and, and not to say that you that people weren't in several bands at one time, because nobody... Nobody really had anything else to do. Right, right, right. Like, it was very incestuous back then. Or just, you know, like incestuous has such a negative sort of exclusivity sort of sound. Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, oh, well, the Seattle scene is so incestuous. But if you really dissect it, it's just a bunch of bored kids without anything to do. And, you know, you're hanging out at somebody's house and there's a practice room in the basement and I remember when Duff joined the Fastbacks, it was just the three of us. It was me, Kim, and Lulu. I played drums, and, you know, we're just sitting around some afternoon, you know, just sitting around, maybe listening to records, not, you know, just wasting time. And Duff, uh, it was Duff's idea. He was like, oh, well, let's go downstairs. Let me play drums, and you play guitar, just to, you know, just to relieve boredom. There was, you know, nothing to do. Um, he's like... He's like, let me let me play drums in in the fastbacks. Just you know, it was just going to be for one practice. He's like, because you're way better guitar player than you are the drummer. And I was like, <laughs> oh, is that an insult towards my drumming? Of course it wasn't, but and of course he was a better drummer than I was. And so we went down there, and you know, played through a bunch of songs. And I was like, well, this is a lot better. You know, there was no thought of getting a new drummer or anything like that. But it was like, oh, well, that makes sense. Um, and who knew that Duff played drums very good like i yeah, you know yeah, yeah. never really heard him play where did he get a chance to practice how did he learn where did he learn how to play drums probably on your drums wherever they were at his about. house because we rehearsed at his house and that's oh, his yeah. mom your drum set it. was in 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 his basement okay so I, that was... I can't remember the house on 38th uh or 39th or whatever it was over by duff's house that was your first kind of fast backy house, let's just call it that. And then there was the one on the 50th, or was it reverse? I can't remember. Oh, gosh. You know, uh, I think by the freeway there. I think maybe the 39th one, then 50th. Yeah, and that's, what I, that's what I thought it was. Because I it's remember going long. over, I remember going over to the 39th house, and it was always like, you know, we'd go over there on Friday, and then Clicky would go out and buy us our little pint of vodka, and because um, he was older. And we go back, and I always love going over there. But it, it was kind of like, hey, let's jam or something like that. And you know, you guys have probably been playing all week or something like that. And it was it's, it, it was my favorite thing to do. Same thing on the the 50th house. It was just like, there's a fucking drum set. You got guitar. Let's what, what are we just sitting up here looking at the, you know, this. Let's go play. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Lulu, <laughs> Lulu always did. It. Lulu was a little. Just like, no, I've had enough of that. No, no, no. It's too loud. Nah, 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 nah. It's like, yeah, fuck you, Lulu. I think actually the 50th house was before because that's where we played with Duff for the first time. Because there is a couple photos from right around then of that basement. And then I think Lulu insists the 39th house was the last one because we were there. The 39th house is where we practiced in 1982. Um, so that was probably, you know. I think maybe it went, and then there was the one out in in Ballard on 85th and and third, you know. Oh and, yeah, 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 yeah. Those, That's those the one I always borrowed Kluki's car. And Kluki would get so fucked up he'd pass out, and I'd be like, "Going, hey Kluki, can I borrow your car? Let me borrow." He's like, "Oh," and I just next thing Kluki wake up the next morning, so where's your fucking car? Oh, Andy has it. 
<laughs> oh yeah, he gave keys, did he? Well, maybe he did. But <laughs> 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 anyway, you slice it, he's got it. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm 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 going all over the map here. So. Oh yeah, but I mean, it, 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 it's it's you know, it's all it's all all, all interesting to, to figure out how this all started. So then, um, so then cleavage was came from the remnants of the because this is kind of interesting cleavage came from the remnants of zip dads no, but no there was another uh johnny vinyl band oh weenus uh, or not or uh not weenus uh i don't i don't really remember that I, I, uh, I, I, uh, because uh, we had that house over on remember cleveland what was the oh, name of that other house the where, where the puds were from and the you was know, it the house of Ken, maybe. Maybe it was the house of Ken, the one that was the Madhouse. Madhouse, okay. The yeah, Madhouse, yeah. that was the name of it. So then, um, it was Johnny Vinyl. Um, um, shit. Uh, um, um, drawing a blank. Garth and not they weren't in the band and then um one of the Boppo boy guys uh shit funny fucker but he kind of fell he, uh I'll think of it in a minute but anyway so they rented this house right that was right behind the record store there Peaches. and that's kind of where we what Peaches record. Yeah, Peaches. That was it. Yeah. And um, oh, Dan King. That's who it was. Dan King, Vinyl, and Garth rented this house. And that was because the Madhouse kind of shut down. And that's when we formed Cleavage. And that was the first time I ever, you know, because I'm always kind of a breast guy, but I had no idea what Cleavage was. I mean, at that age. And somebody explains it to me, and I'm like, that's fucking awesome. And so it was like, what are you in the band? I'm going to cleavage. And that's when Larson was in the band at that time. Oh, right. Okay. So Jeff Larson ended up being, I think there's a picture of Johnny Vinyl. Jeff played guitar. That's right. Jeff played guitar in cleavage. Oh, yeah. Okay. Larson was the bass player because, you know, you got to dumb it down to four strings for Larson. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, what was the name of the Johnny Vinyl band before that that had. Uh, John Conti in it. What was that? And there was an Asian guy in there too. What the? Oh, there was Alan. Michael. Alan. Yeah, Alan. My, I can't remember the name of the band. Um, let me let me just search my emails. It uh, wasn't we. Who was in Weenus? Uh, Weenus was Al Block. Oh right. Okay, it wasn't it was that. Al yeah. Dave Shoemate from the Cheaters. Yeah. Let's see. Right, for the last the show I saw the cheaters play at was at uh, Fifth and Aloha. Iceman. The missing link. Oh, missing link. Okay, so that was that was John Conti. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Vinyl on guitar. Was it Todd Fleischman on bass? No, because Todd didn't play bass until he joined the living. Yeah, because it's all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Todd Fleischman was playing bass. I go, I didn't even know you knew how to play bass. No, no, he 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 uh, he was he was he signed on uh, before he'd even he'd even <laughs> the bass or played. And that and uh, that's totally punk rock there. Oh well, yeah, for sure. So the yeah. missing link <clears throat> was John Conti, and then that morphed into and Cleavage. But Conti wasn't in cleavage. Say again. Con John Conti was so the missing link. No, 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 for sure. Larson. He was probably the only one that had changed. He was probably uh, uh, Duff. Yeah, another whack job singer, you know that you you know got to get rid of. <laughs> and and Duff was did Duff sing in the the uh, in cleavage? Was he the singer? I think so. I think him and yeah. Larson sang a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that would make that would make sense. Yeah, I think Duff was a singer in Cleveland. Yeah, 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 which 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 strangely sort of makes sense that uh, like a, a year before, a year and a half before, 
Duff replaces John Conti as being the guitar player singer in the band, a, 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 a fact that would repeat itself unsuccessfully, you know, about a year and a half later. So, so you guys are, you guys are doing that. I know that, uh, that Cleavage did a few shows and, and of course there was the Cleveland, the, uh, the house where Black Flag played a show in the living room. Uh, most. And then I remember when Stiv Bader's, the Dead Boys came over and we had a big fucking blowout party there and the there must have been 300 people in this, you know, 1,200 square foot house. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, those were, of course, some. We had a big target on 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 Peaches' record because the, the 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 brick wall of uh, of Peaches was right there, and it was it was painted all white. And uh, we had a couch that was running right along there, and the door opened right to the right to that to that wall. He went down the stairs, and so I got I found some paint in the basement, some old paint, and I put a big bullseye, but I was too short, so. It wasn't really round. It was kind of like half round. And, like this. and we'd sit there and there and we'd drink our beer. And then it was like, bullseye, you must have four feet of glass on the side of that thing. But yeah, no, Cleveland, I, Cleveland was a very notable. Uh, the house was more notable than the band. Um, in oh, history. absolutely. Yeah, I remember the cop The cop showed up when the, when the uh, that DOA show um, that was there. And... Uh, the, the cop showed up and there must have been, you know, two inches of beer, slime, guts and whatever on the cops walked in there. And I was the only one that kind of stayed and went through there. And they're like going, Jesus Christ, this looks like a fucking war zone in here. And I'm like, eh, well, 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 you know, me as a landlord now, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you should have been here when DOA <laughs> was playing. In the no fucking, no fucking punk rockers are in my house. Yeah, I wouldn't allow that. I just would allow a war zone. I mean, yeah. think, of, think of Black Flag. Remember that show in your living room? No, Black Flag, not DOA. You're yeah, right. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. I mean, it was, you know, if you want to, you know, if you want to crash course in the future of music, it's like, you know, it's like somebody just taking your face and slamming it against the i mean it was it was insane how um high energy that 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 show was and you know in your living room it's like oh we don't have a show we'll play in your living room you know well let's right. get a living room dining room it was you know yeah yeah oh yeah multi -person. Person. yeah <laughs> yeah okay so I, I remember that show that we played up there i can't remember the up by the the the, the youth jail up on pill hill up there it, it was Black Flag. Ron Ray's was uh, singing and dipping, and I can't remember. What, it must. It might have been the veins that opened for him. Oh and, right, at, uh, Saint, uh, not St. Joseph's. Uh, the whatever that place is up on I L F or what, what, one of those. One of those. Whatever you rent it out and do your own thing. And um, I remember Dittman took a quarter and fucking threw it at Ron Ray's and hit him right here in the nose, broke him, and all hell broke loose and. You know, and that, that's when I first bought my Vista. I had my Vista light drum set at that point, and I'm just like going off. Oh, and it was up on stage on the side. I fucking pulled it all out to the fire escape because I thought I'm, I thought they were gonna fucking trash the place. And that was my baby. I still have that set. That was my baby. You know. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, yeah. Gosh, I I don't think I, I must have not been at that show because I don't. Oh remember. well, yeah, that was fucking notorious. Right, that's the one that the subhumans were supposed to play too but that didn't yeah maybe but yeah yeah there's a you see the poster on on the internet on, on facebook occasionally yeah cool. yeah yeah great uh great poster i must have missed that one for some reason which is too bad, but, uh, so anyway you have your your cleavage you have you know, the, all, all these all these bands that are, you know, where everybody's just looking for something to stick, right? You know, something that can or that just, can make it more than four months. You know, and everybody was was all these bands were playing shows, whether they be hall shows or the Gorilla Room or you know whatever. There's you know probably a mainly few. hall shows. I mean, you know, it, it, most of the shit I played was hall shows. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I mean, there was no, yeah, there wasn't a, a a bar to play at, and and. And it was not interesting, like, you know, the people that were older at that point in 1980, 81 in Seattle were not really interested in hearing that kind of music. No, they were all playing at Astor Park and... Right, you know, they, they wanted to hear... Uh, Parkers uh, and... 
a well uh, well manicured uh, uh, band playing you know popular uh, rock of the '80s music, which yeah. you know I don't blame them, but at the same time it's like I do. Well, there was just not much. I mean, other than Rex was always a possibility, and we it seems like we played there, you know, often enough. But that was about the only actual bar that would that catered to anything other than other than than uh, top 40 and, and rock of the 80s um and then so at some point this all sort of falls apart um and you once again you and duff don't have any any real band to be in so you joined my brother al scott Dittman, who was the greatest and he was in the, he was in the zip dads yeah yeah he came out of yeah that. yeah, yeah. And he was also in the cheaters for sure. The, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm talking about with me. So right, 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 right. I mean, I'm just yeah. thinking of of his of his history, and uh, started the uh, the deans. Yes. Um, which, Sam Lilly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that that lineup um, lasted, you know, until some you know, time. I, in I, um, I think we. We sort of figured out, I was talking to my brother Al, because there's a, a tape of New Year's Eve going into 1982. Right, right, yeah. The Deans. Um, and, and that was, remember that doofy fucker, I think his name was Sean, he was a piano player. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 he was in there for a little bit too. Okay, yeah, and Al said, <clears throat> Al told me the other day that because uh, he moved to New York sometime fairly early in 1982. Mm -hmm. um, but he said at one point the Deans uh, played with John Conti as a singer, like not a show or anything, but like at least practiced with him, you know, maybe once and maybe also practiced with uh, um, Leif Cole. What? Leif Cole, they turned it, that turned into whatever the Bombardiers. Uh, Bombardiers that was after it. after Al got back from New York. But um, you know, I'm just just thinking of this 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 uh, uh, core of you know, it's almost like what are those little atom things with the uh, things flying around? Of it's all the, jumbled up, you know. Yeah, yeah, and everybody everybody's just looking for looking for something to stick, you know. Like, and it was you know, in hindsight, it was pretty easy to to think that nothing was going to stick because there was nowhere to play. There was no, you know, whatever scene we had was just all of us. And of mm -hmm. course we would all go see each other's bands and, you know, try to have some fun and, and do our things, but it was really hard to, uh, you know, get anything to stick. Like everybody wanted to be in a band and wanted to make records and wanted to go on tour and do all those things. But, you know, you just putts around for four months and, you know, nothing would work and somebody would get bored and, and quit. So you'd get somebody else instead of them and <clears throat> call it a new band and and keep going. So at some point in later 1981, <clears throat> you had joined the Deans and uh, and Duff and Chris Udding start The Living. And John Conti, you know whose old band was called Laughing Sam, I believe. I, I, I can't remember. First time I saw John Conti was years before that, and I was I I was dating this chick. I was probably in eighth grade or ninth grade or something. We went over to a house party or not a house party. And she said, "Let's go over to this, listen to this band." And Sangster was playing with him. Mm -hmm. Um. That was that band for sure. It was Jim uh, Sanders. Oh, was it? Yeah, and they played. He, he played. They played Paint It Black, and and you know, Conti's a charismatic guy when he wants to be. You know, I mean, it's too bad he's you know as like most lead singers, fucking nuts, but um, uh, but in a good way. I mean, I like Conti a lot. He and I talk, but and he knows he's nuts, but um, but I saw him play that play Paint It Black, and I was just like, wow. He's I mean, it was one of the coolest fucking things I ever seen. You know, I mean, I'm standing right there and they're doing it. And I was like, oh, cool. So that Sounds was like <laughs> real music. <laughs> well, it was. They were good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. And we yeah. went to go see that band uh, maybe at like St. Joseph's Hall or 
something like that, whenever it was, maybe 19. Yeah, I think I saw him at St. Joseph too, yeah. 19, yeah, we, we probably all went there because, you know, oh, you look and see a poster. Well, this looks like our kind of posters. It's one of the places that we would rent to put on shows, and it's all bands that I'd never heard of. And so we all go there, and of course, we caused some problems, got kicked out. Sure, yeah. Isn't it amazing? How the hell did we communicate back then without having cell phones or or any of that shit? I mean, there must have been like, I, 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 it blows my eye. I can't even think about it now. It's like, how does everybody show up at one place? You know, it's like, you don't have this. It's yeah, like, it's, it's, it's got to be over here. You want to go? Uh, you know, got to be some sort of telepathy. Because if you weren't home, you didn't get a phone call. No, you know, if if you if you there, well, I guess although we there was answering machines, so like, okay, I'm gonna call everyone at least leave a message. Practices at four p.m. tomorrow, and uh, we have a show at uh, the Gorilla Room. You know, they needed a band at the last minute, so we could yeah. practice four till six and then go down there and play a show. I mean, I know that happened. And there was even occasionally, I believe the band was called the Butt Boys. <laughs> and oh. I forget who was in it, but you know, we're all sitting around Kim and Lula's house and you know, Brian Runnings or somebody calls from the gorilla, gorilla room. It's like, well, one of the bands fell off. Do you guys have a, uh, a band that can play? And we're like, look around the room it's like sure so we went downstairs and you know learned you know uh played a couple sonic songs you know just whatever the whatever the kind of regular songs we would do and uh went down there and played that night and i was like wow that was that was kind of fun you know because we probably would have gone there anyway so if you had a band that was playing then you know maybe you got uh free rainiers or you know whatever it sure. was but you, you get to go play it was fun you know yeah yeah well, what else are we gonna do you know go 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 play some music and i believe like at some point it was probably 1981 1982 we were all in different bands and nobody was getting anywhere nobody was making any money everybody was just just floundering and uh i think it was me you and al decided that we were gonna try to get some gigs as a uh, as a bar band do you remember that and uh <clears throat> I, I do yeah yeah and, and we're like well all these bands are making like 200 bucks a night you know playing just songs at bars we can do that can't we so wrote out a list of you know like 15 songs and went to wherever somebody's practice room that whoever may, must have been something that you were in had a decent practice room that wasn't in a basement i don't remember um, or maybe I had a, I had a place over in Wallingford, and then no, actually before Wallingford, I think before I can't remember, we because I was in a band called the Gestures, right? And that was that was you know that was my first band that actually made money. I mean, we go, but that's because I was over twenty one, and we play at bars, and we do you know we did all our original stuff, and we actually almost got because Muscle Shoals was going to turn into a record company and they were going to sign us. And this is, you know, Dave Kincaid and, you know, all that kind of, you know, during that stuff, that, that time of year. But I had a rehearsal studio kind of, it was over in Wallingford, kind of behind Gasworks there. Was that where it was at? Gosh, it sure could have been. It might have been, uh, it, might, it seems like it was before that because you would have been in the gestures till 82 or something, 83 maybe, right? Yeah, it was 82, I think it was um you know would have been maybe, after, 80, maybe 83 right after after the deans um and i remember that because i was i was like happy that you were in a band that was actually getting somewhere like you know like just banging your head against the wall trying to get something to go somewhere and um so the you you joined the deans with with my brother and scott dittman from the cheaters and you know, they the deans got a few shows. We opened. I think we opened the first show at the Crocodile. I think I, I, I could be wrong about this. When it turned into the Crocodile, we were the deans? first show. I well, thought that, the deans was. <clears throat> well, that, that would have been. It would have been called the Athens. It wasn't the Crocodile yet, but it was that same space, and that was you know that was early. When did it turn into the Crocodile? Oh, in you know early nineties. Oh Jesus! Okay, never mind. Yeah, so, maybe it was Athens then. It was yeah, the yeah, first... it was definitely the Athens. It was the same same spot. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And it was Jim Anderson doing sound, who was you know the sound man for the Enemy. You know, so it was all it was all 
you know, in the, the sort of started by the crowd of people that were, you know, a few years older than even we were at the time and were actually, you know, actually really getting things done. Um, <clears throat> so, so you joined the deans and Duff joined or started the living with Chris Udding, which is interesting because those guys were always a little bit at, uh, at loggerheads with each other. But then at the same time in, in the, the and, deans, and they still are. <laughs> <laughs> and the deans were uh, Al Block and Scott Dittman, who were also at loggerheads in the 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 uh, in the cheaters. They were the ones that broke the band uh, the, ended up breaking up the band in a uh, in a fist fight on stage, you know, a throw throwdown, not just a joke fight, but a, a, a real who was doing the throwdown? Was it was it uh, um Dittman and who else? And Al Block. Oh shit! They got into a oh. That was you know Who, that was. Uh, I can't imagine Al, Al won. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there there couldn't have been a clear winner. That would have been a, a Halloween nineteen seventy nine. No, oh, um, more, and more I, of a I, wrestling match probably. But yeah, it was, well, it, it's it started on stage. We had a makeshift wooden stage at a, at our Halloween show, and it ended up rolling out onto the sidewalk of the uh of the uh uct hall fucking Dittman. <laughs> and you know there again then a year later they're in a band together and uh and 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 uh you know so a year later then then duff and chris Edding are in a band together the uh, living with john conti who was you know fresh out of the missing link pretty much it's like okay let's get a band together and i, I remember they didn't have a a, 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 a a for sure bass player at the time um because kim warnick from the fastbacks said that she played their first show or two in the living and uh and then at, at some point uh uh todd fleischman steps up to the plate and you know Learns the bass in two weeks and yeah, yeah, all yeah. Said, yeah. And, and, uh, and 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 the, uh, the the core of the living had started, which would have been also, you know, mid 1981. And uh, um, so, you know, they doing odd shows here and there, most probably mostly hall shows, maybe some maybe a little bit of Rex for sure. I think I have a tape of the living at Rex. Yeah, um, yeah, they didn't play many shows. I remember I used to go because Flashman lived up in Laurelhurst on what, what are forty eighth, forty ninth, whatever it was, and that's where they rehearsed was down there in the basement. Right, that's probably yeah, how yeah. Flashman got into the band because he had a fucking rehearsal place, you know. Right, right, and and we, you know, I remember there being parties down in Todd's mom's basement that oh, were yeah. that were just you know legendary. Yeah. And yeah. so, and you know, and Todd was cool, and he loved music for sure. And you know, no. he was always around, but he would never picked up an instrument. So he, jo so he joins, and they they start doing shows. And then, you know, I'm not being in the band. I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, 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 apparently, Duff and Chris, you know, couldn't quite get along. Really? They put, <laughs> they put an ad in the Rocket for a drummer because duff is like i'm you know i'm once again he steps up to the plate as he had in uh, the difference between uh the uh, missing link going into cleavage you know uh uh, uh or, 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 no wait no I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself there um like he, he he wants to play guitar so they get greg gilmore that all happens um, Greg Gilmore, by the way, just blew me away. I mean, first time I saw him play, I was like, when they played fucking Baller and Blitz, I was just like, what's Conti in it? No, I was just like, fuck, this guy's fucking amazing. You yeah, know? yeah, no, he, uh, Greg Gilmore brought a, you know, he brought this. Brought it up to here. Right, right, something that, something that the, the Seattle, you know, the, the that our group of people something that our group of people didn't really have back then was, you know, a, a, a drummer who was, you know, had the chops and was able to play the fast music, you know, just tirelessly 
and uh, you know, a, not afraid to be a drummer show off too. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, like, first time I saw Greg Gil Gilmore play, I was just like, well, maybe I should just fucking quit. <laughs> you know, I, I was just like, holy shit, you know. Nah. Of course, I see Dave. I see Dave Grohl today playing. I was just watching it. So uh, what was that band where uh, after after Nirvana? Um, Foo Fighters. Uh, uh, not the Foo Fighters. The one before that. In between, um, Lanigan played with them for a little while. Oh, uh, Stone Age. Queens of the Stone Age. So he played with Queens of the Stone Age mm -hmm. for a while. And I was just watching a YouTube thing uh, on their big hit, whatever the hell it was. But I was just like going, Jesus Christ, this guy's fucking amazing. I can, there's no way I can, I can, if I would have practiced drums from then to today, there's no way I could play that shit. It's just like fucking mind boggling. Yeah. You know, anyway, <laughs> I'm digressing. Oh, no, it, it's yeah. absolutely killer. And uh, yeah. Uh, my big thing was, is I was a big tempo drummer and I could play and I could fit in the pocket, but these fills, these guys are doing these days and all that stuff. It's like drum solo. I'm not your drum solo guy. It's like, bah, 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 bah. You know, sound check. That's it. Drum fill. No solo. I can do a fill, but no solo. Anyway, shit, we're digressing again. Uh, but so, um, you know, this would be sometime in early 1982 that uh, that uh, that Greg joins the Living, and you know, it sort of took them to to another place. You know, it was like, wow, well, this is um, you know, this is really something else. Um, and they, you know, definitely burned very bright for a few months. And well, maybe even a little longer than that, but yeah. Well, not not very long. There, the last living show was uh, July 30th, 1982. Right, but, I, but, but I'm but i talking about before, because I, I would see him, you know, I'd go over to Flashman's house, watch him play and do all that stuff. So Oh, yeah, yeah, I, but for sure, like yeah. once, you know, like- We're talking about on the scene. Like, they, you know, it, it sort of just, just took them to the, this next level. And sometime in, you know, early to mid 1982, they went and recorded those, you know, seven songs that are to be on the, the record. Um, and, and, you know, at that point it seemed like, wow, here's a, here's a band that, you know, actually has, you know, maybe has what it takes to, to get out of, you know, everybody just wanted to, you get the boot off their neck. <laughs> yeah. Get a, get a record deal, make a cool record, go on tour, you know, do all the things that, that regular bands did, but you know, it's, and it's, and we were, everybody was doing, you know, it was, it was a time that none, none of these bands really did anything to bow to commercialism. Like no, at that point, I mean, nobody really knew what to do, even if they wanted to do that. It was just yeah, not, yeah. A, not yeah. a possibility. Not that we were, not that anyone was trying to be uncommercial on purpose, like you know some of the some of the art bands and stuff like that tried to be uncommercial, and it was never that. You know, we're just doing what we liked, and what, you know, we're sitting around wondering why, you know, twenty people go to all our shows and stuff. And, and well, it's funny to... because when we first, I I remember this in you know eighth grade or eighth grade, it was eighth grade, you know, and Duff and I were you know thick as thieves back then and still are, but. Um, you know, we, you know, I'm too small. I was too small to be a jock. Duff was too blankly and, you know, a little gangly to be a, to be a jock. And it was like, well, how are we going to get chicks? And it was like, well, let's, you know, maybe we'll play music and get chicks. And it's funny because I don't want to say we got into it to get chicks, but we did. But once we got into it, it became our passion. You know, it was a big passion thing. So all the chick thing went out the window so it was never really a commercial thing for us right right know? but you know like and when you first start in 1979 you know whatever you whatever you guys started playing and started playing together and stuff like that it, it takes on a, a a thing of its own but my theory is by about 1982 um you know everybody had been doing that they've been kicking at the door you know and seeing some other bands not seattle bands but other bands you know, that started out with the same sort of humble beginnings and, and people were getting record deals and people are getting places and 
you know, getting the, you know, getting to make a cool record that sounded or, good. Or being, being able to afford to buy something that sounds good because, you know, I mean that, you know, I mean, I remember Duff, we called it the fuck. But, uh, foghorn. The, the foghorn. Yeah, the old <laughs> foghorn. I don't even know if he still has that, but it, it was that old kind of S, I don't even know if it was a Gibson, but it was an SG style bass. Yeah, yeah, Gibson had. SG bass, an EBO. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely yeah. foghorn. Yeah, whatever that, and you know, whatever blown out amp that he was playing through. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the old foghorn. Bring <laughs> bring fog fog. Yeah, yeah. Oh, is there going to be a bass amp there? No, I guess we better bring the foghorn. <laughs> <laughs> Can't we just go direct? <laughs> <laughs> but the, you know, like, but, but my theory is like by, by around around that time, you know, uh, people were just like, well, I mean, not not like in a sellout way, but people were just in it like, well, gosh, you know, we've been playing music now for you know three years. You know, five years, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever it was, um, you know, let's 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 get our shit together and try to try to get try to do something that you know that that is not just you know going to attract our same twelve friends from you know a yeah, month something ago. that's commercially viable but not a sell. I I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, the veins or not the veins of the living was was kind of an odd one in that it was sort of a step in a different direction but it you know it it had the you know it had definitely had the power of of you know of music to come right like it was wasn't metal but it was not anti-metal <laughs> no 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 it wasn't but it wasn't and it wasn't just purely punk rock, but it was punk rock, you know. Yeah, 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 exactly. It was, it was, you know, was ten minute to... warning came out of that whole kind of right, right. And it, it, ten minute warning in a lot of ways to me were a little bit more anti commercial, um, you know, like making music that was, you know, definitely a full foot in art rock and experimental music, um, rather than rather than you know, like the living was just kick-ass rock. Right, and, right. And the Deans, your band at the time was, you know, definitely had a one foot in 60s, you know, garage well, it was, rock. It rock. was made more commercial, but the, even the band after that, when I went into the gestures later, I mean, and we were playing shows and making money and, you know, I, and, you know, we wrote a lot of our own songs and you can tell it was very 80s then, but, you know, I was still playing fucking Tom Petty songs and, you know, because you're playing bars and people want to hear yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. Right, right. And, and, uh, and it, it's but just, the living wasn't doing any of that. No, no. They, but they, I don't know that they may have played a, uh, once, once Greg joined, they probably did a few couple bar shows, but well, most of that was art galleries, art galleries and hall shows and, and, and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, definitely 1982 in Seattle was a year of, you know, people just throwing things at the, the wall and seeing what would stick. And nothing and stuck. It, what, <laughs> yeah. see, see what we can do that doesn't suck. Yeah, well, and, or stick or whatever. And then at some point, you know, it must have been August 1982, they just sort of stopped. And Greg and uh, Duff, you know, one by one started started the 10 minute warning and Right. And the living were were over. Yeah, yeah. That was the that you know because of my whole music career up to that point until he until he started the living and I went into the deans. Um, it, uh, you know, Duff and I had always been in bands together. I mean, it was Duff and I, Duff and I, Duff oh yeah, and I, Duff, Duff and Andy for sure. Yeah, always. Duff and Andy, and then and then I remember I think I went into the deans. And it was kind of a weird dichotomy because that, that's when Duff went into, but you know, living, I think soon after that, and we were kind of a little bit lost without each other. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you have your, if you have your team there, then, you know, you yeah. know, things can't be going that wrong, that far wrong because you, you know, it's like one of you would keep an eye on, you know, if, if somebody had an idea, here's a song. It's like, Hey, you know what? That song sucks. Let's not yeah. do it. I remember, the time, I remember the time when he left Seattle, when he left Seattle and went to LA, Duff, I'm talking about. And we were going down 35th driving. He's going, I'm out of here. I'm leaving. I'm going to, I'm going to go to LA. 
you should come with me. And I'm like, look, I'm like, well, what the fuck? What are you talking about? I'm not going to fucking LA. I got a job, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, but it did, it did. It broke my heart. I mean, it, it, I mean, not, not broke my heart, but it was just like, right, right. It was, it was, it was, it was quite a thing. Like, Wait a minute. Yeah. And it's bad enough you're playing in another band, but now you're going to fucking leave Seattle. What the hell's wrong with you? Uh, and, you know, we don't know. I, I don't know if I'm going to get to do one of these uh, Zoom calls with Duff. That would be pretty good, though. But what made him, what was the last straw? He was playing a 10 minute warning with Greg Gilmore, who went. Well, oh, I know him. what the last straw is, but I don't really want to say it. <laughs> it had something to do with a girl uh -huh. and, and heroin. Huh. He's uh -huh. like, I'm out, I'm fucking out of here, you know. And I'm not gonna name names. I know why he left, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm sure. You know, he just he just had it because you know, the, you know, when he left and what when he when did he leave in eighty four? Could have been eighty four. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was playing in the Crotch Rockets, I think then, and then um, um, uh, but he left in eighty four, and it was just like. You know, there's too much fucking heroin. This is, you know, a bad, you know, it was basically heroin, you know, it was heroin and a girl that was why he left. So, you know, me and he and I had that talk when we were going down 35th, and I was just like, fuck, fuck. Okay. And, you know, he, and Greg, he and Greg packed up and moved to. Got in the old Maverick, the old red Maverick, and. It's like going fuck he's living he actually called me you know and by this time i was out of the crotch rockets and i was like going this is i got I, i'm not going to be because heroin got into the crotch rockets you know with tommy hansen and 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 donner um and yogi and that's who was in the crotch rocket. i can't i can't remember you know, tommy, tommy bonehead hansen um donner and yogi we were in the crotch rockets it was a great band we played up and we go up and play in Canada. You know, I remember all those years we went up to Canada all that time, not the Crotch Rockets, but we played a no, great show. Early, early 80s, we were always up there. Oh, fuck, all the time. I mean, hanging out and listening to, you know, Subhumans and DOA and the Modernettes and, you know, it was great. And Gas Town or Gat, whatever that, that part of town. What was the name of that house The mat, uh, up there? The, um, the that house we always stayed at. Yeah, yeah, with Dale Weiss, Phil Saintsbury, yeah, yeah. Ron Ray's. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was not a house, it was a floor of a building. <laughs> oh, was it? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, so the Crotch Rockets went up there and we played a show and we kicked ass. You know, I had chicks buying me beers and, you know, whatever, whatever. And then, and then we went to a party and fucking those guys somehow score heroin and they're fucking shooting up heroin. And the cops show up and they're fucking pointing at me and I'm like, oh no, I don't do that shit. I don't know what you're fucking talking about, you know. And just ruined when we had the show the next night. It's they were all fucking strung out, you know. They're and I just went, I can't fucking deal with this anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was that was our last show and I left and I just said, me and Bonehead went back to Seattle that night. We didn't even stick, spend the night, but oh right, was, after, where, where, what right after the show. What show? Where was that show? Do you remember? It was a big place. I can't remember. I don't remember, but it was like I'm, I'm, I'm like done, and that, and it really soured me on the music scene in Seattle because you know, we had we had a meeting after that that show, you know, down in uh, Washington. I can tell these guys are all fucked up, and I just said, Tom Bone Bonehead and I just said we're out. Yeah, yeah, this is not working. So you, you, to, to quote the. Uh... To quote the living, no thanks, man. Yeah, no thanks, man. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so I said I don't need to go down that dark alley, but you know, yeah, you know, yeah. But, but, I know this is more about the living than you know the screwy music scene in Seattle. <laughs> well, I, I, to, to me, it's about the screwy music scene in Seattle because you know it's so intertwined with. You know, everybody, everybody trying to do the, basically trying to do the same thing with whatever, whatever sort of sound that any group of people made. And, you know, Duff, uh, just thinking when when Greg Gilmore joined the living Duff must have, I mean, it must have been a, a you know, a, like a, a conscious effort. It's like, okay, now 
I'm going to, you know, sort of take the reins and, and let's, you know, have this, you know, blazing outfit and all the songs are going to be fast. And, you know, where, whereas the living before that, you know, had a variety of music. They had their, their fast punk tunes and they had their medium tempo songs. And it was a little bit more of a variety bag. And then, uh, then when Greg joined and, and Chris wasn't in it, it would appear to me that that Duff took the reins and okay, here's what we're gonna we're gonna focus, we're gonna practice, we're gonna make this you know razor sharp band, which of course they were, yeah. Um, and you know it just just the thought of how everything was in those years, nothing lasted. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, because I, I I I it's funny because I think back in those days and I'm thinking, God, that must have been like. 15 years of my life you know it was like six yeah you know, yeah or you know even in the thick of things like you know three two months two months was an eternity you know right right like, right uh you know and i know lots of us didn't really have jobs we just scrounged some money <laughs> you know, I, I always worked that's one thing i always did i always had yeah, a job. Well, smart i i didn't you know i was just like i don't know somehow somehow playing music's gonna is gonna magically grab me and and uh elevate me to some uh bigger uh i guess i probably did have a job now that i think about it oh you had to have some job parents weren't taking care of you that long yeah not 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 that well but you not know, like my daughter's 28 and still living at home but anyway that's a different story you know and it, it is <laughs> but, yeah. but you know i lived at my parents for a long time and they were great they were really really nice and you know i know they didn't like our music but they allowed it way longer than they should have to appear in their basement <laughs> yeah same with dust mom she was an angel she was she was awesome but you know she and worked a lot mom too. too you know yeah. i mean like we never got to have any parties in our basement there was a separate entrance so we could go down there and you know have our friends over but uh we didn't, yeah you know. There was no yeah. no actual parties like uh, like the living <laughs> and, and yeah. you know, whatever those bands were in Todd's basement. Yeah. Um, and and uh, so everything just sort of falls apart. Everybody, you know, kicks around for a while. The farts, 10 minute warning. And then, you know, must have been, you know, those bands, you know, there, there probably was a fair amount of drug abuse in that band as well as their Ten minute war, yeah probably at some point yeah it, you know just seems like 1982 was kind of the also the pivotal year that people started to do dope a lot yeah i got that that's when i kind of left that scene me you know it was kind of like after that you know you know he did the 10 minute war and that's when i went to the gestures and i was in more of a the club scene then so i right, I right. that's not this didn't have I, you know, so i can't really recall on all that was going on there but you know that's when the bopple boys and you know all those guys were doing you know mdma and or whatever the fuck it was and heroin and got way right, too right. It was it was it was definitely right around that time and i don't know you know you can't really find one person to blame for that but it definitely it definitely took its toll on well, you know, the, Seattle, the Seattle underground scene at that point. And so then it's, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of split off into bands that were, you know, trying to get away from that and bands that fully embraced that. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That, that's basically why Duff left. So. Yeah. 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 So, you know, then ended up right in the middle of it later. Yeah. Yeah, world champion drinker. <laughs> Half a gallon and a fifth a day. I'm like, what the fuck? Holy shit. Not the, uh, you know, not the greatest, but, you know. Yeah, you know. Glad he's still then, around. Yeah. Oh, no, I am too. You know, uh, you know, I, I went through all that with him. But anyway. Um yeah, I guess that's that's for another podcast. That's for another podcast. I think they made a movie out of it or something. You know. yeah, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. It's but, like, what um, are those things called with paper in them? Uh, uh, I don't know. Book? 
Book. 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 Yeah, with Book. letters on paper that's all they're all like stacked uh, together. Well, you, you don't do that. You just use your, you know, iPad and you read it. Well, that, that's why I couldn't remember what those things were called. Because <laughs> I, 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 I don't, you know, I, I don't even do that. I, I, I always get a, 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 I think it's something on tape, book on tape, where the book on tape. Books yeah, that's where tape. they read it to you, so you don't have to be bothered with. What yeah. are those little? What are those little like A's called? Letters. Yeah, letters. Yeah, alphabet. Uh, alphabet. Yeah, yeah, letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't. But uh, you know, I mean, like Todd Todd Flashman. I mean, he's a uh, Flashman. I call him Flashman all the time. Um, you know, he's doing good. He didn't get caught up in that shit. You no, know? I spoke to him the other day. Todd. Yeah. Fantastic. No, he's fantastic. He's always a good guy, and um, Conti, you know little still weird but he's a lead singer he can get me he's got an excuse so. <laughs> he's got an overriding excuse to be as weird as he can be i well, don't know what gilmore's doing i, I spoke to him uh, a couple days ago and oh. um, he's just he's on it he's like sharp and you know it's like yeah let's rock it's like yeah you know i mean because he was always the killer drummer like oh, everybody was, wanted to the get best. him in their band and yeah. uh and uh um you know it just it just you know didn't work out for him to be in everybody's band but um is he still playing music i mean is he in a band now or is he i don't think so i don't think he's you know got any you know rock band uh uh going at the moment yeah i mean now is not the time to you know initiate a new rock band i suppose but now is the time to start making some plans to do something if you're you know that yeah. way well i still got i bought i still got my 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 vista light set like it's out in the garage but the garage is so fucking full of shit but but i bought a pintech set an electronic mm -hmm. set so yeah, yeah, yeah. you know you put the headphones on and you can play all the fastback songs you want on that thing <laughs> you can, instantly you're in the coliseum playing in uh, led zeppelin <laughs> there you go you, you press the led zeppelin sound on the <laughs> electronics drum set but yeah, yeah, it yeah. doesn't blow everybody out in the house so right right it's like you can actually do it pretty much at any any time and all all anybody would hear is a little ricky ticky ticky in the uh yeah. slappity 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 yeah, anyway. i shall all right good Anything talk else? andy i good i good. hope I hope What's at some point we can, uh, you know, we can hoist one. For now, let's hoist one to Scott Dittman. Oh, Cop Potty Dittman, and we must end this with Chicon Rampart, Rampart Smolkin. Smolkin. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Living 1982 podcast. Circle back for weekly episodes and find out about each week's special guests and where to stream the music by following the band's release on Instagram at the Living 1982.